Good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Skip Rutherford. I'm dean of the University of Arkansas Clinton School of Public Service. And I want to welcome you to behind the scenes at Governor Clinton's 1991 presidential announcement. I uh, first want to encourage everyone to turn your cell phones and other electronic devices off. I want to say a particular thanks to all the staff at the Old State House, including uh, Kathy Matthews and Mary Nell Branch with the Department of Arkansas Heritage, Bill Gatewood, who, uh, uh, is, uh, who runs this museum, Heather and others who have been very helpful. Um, so we, we, we really appreciate the support of the Old State House. And I also want to say a thanks uh, uh, to Stephanie Street and Lena Moore, who, with the Clinton Foundation, put on an incredible weekend of programming for Little Rock and for all. And to Nikolai De Pippa, who runs the best college speaker series in the country, and he is here. <laughs> Twenty years ago, to the date and the hour, 12 noon, we may be a little bit late, but we're close. We're certainly closer than most Clinton times. <laughs> the announcement for Governor Clinton's presidential bid was made here. And we are gathered back here on this historic date to have a Arkansas family discussion about that particular time. We have as panelists, and then we want to invite others to participate and to share stories. We have as panelists three people who were very involved in that day and in that campaign. In 1991, Jimmy Lou Fisher was our state treasurer. And she, on October 3rd, 1991, introduced Governor Clinton at the announcement. Saturday, on October 1, 2011, she introduced uh, at the 20th uh, anniversary commemoration. She's now on the staff of Attorney General Dustin McDaniel. Bev Lindsay helped launch this 1992 campaign. She was there early uh, in that old paint store on 7th Street uh, and was very instrumental in the early planning uh, and, and all the activities as we launched this bid. On October 3rd, 1991, she was here at the Old State House working on logistics and details and de dealing with a bunch of frantic people that Stephanie Street had to deal with two days ago. Yeah. Yeah. Mac McClarty, Clinton's oldest friend, I don't mean that in terms of age, <laughs> uh, in terms of longevity, they were kindergarten classmates and hope. You all heard the story that he really does believe in a place called hope. and. Uh, Mac was an early supporter of the campaign. I happened to be working with him at the time. And I saw what he did in, in 1991, uh, early on when there were not a lot of business people uh, involved in Governor Clinton's campaign. He was on the phone, he was traveling, he was speaking. He later became the first White House Chief of Staff. And the announcement of him being named White House Chief of Staff was made at the Old State House. So, um, all three of these people. <laughs> the planning, as I recall, in 20 years takes its toll on memories. There were four finalists for the announcement, four locations that made the final cut. One was the Arkansas State Capitol. One was in front of the Arlington Hotel, which was the scene where Joe T. Robinson accepted the vice presidential nomination in 1928. In those days, you weren't nominated at conventions. The, they, they came to your home city and state, and Joe T. Robinson, you've seen the great photographs, accepted the nomination. 
because of the Clinton connection to Hot Springs, the Joe T. Robinson connection, and the majesty of the Arlington Hotel, that was a finalist. The third finalist was Little Rock Central High School, and I don't need to explain why that would be a finalist. And then finalist number four was the Old State House. So those were the four that made the final cut as the decision was made. So we lead to October 3rd, 1991, 12 noon, uh, and let's talk about the recollections of that day. And Bev, will you uh, lead us off? What you remember and recall. I think the most interesting thing about what I remember is talk that- Talk to your mic, yeah. I think the most interesting thing I remember and realize right now is that the last 20 years have done a lot of damage to our memories. <laughs> and it's all, it's a collective memory a lot of it are, are stories and um, things that I've heard over the last week or so since I started talking about doing this and of course running into all of our friends over the weekend and hearing their stories. But I think the most, th the, the biggest surprise to me I was, to, was when I realized that, I'm still buzzing a little bit, was to realize how some things never change and some things are completely different than, than the way we started. I can point to just a few of those instances here. For one thing, the speech. Frank Greer. Hold on, just a minute. We're going to the the, the we're going to have to get a microphone. <coughs> you mean y'all can't hear me? Okay. For one thing, the speech. Is, is this better? Okay. <laughs> For one thing, the speech. 20 years ago, Frank Greer, who was a media, uh, a national media political consultant, had been working with Clinton for a couple of years, and um, he flew into town, you know, a couple of days before with the draft speech. And so the day before Clinton, he and Clinton sit, sat down to go over the speech, and Clinton decided that it wasn't exactly what he wanted, and he needed to work on it. Can you imagine that? <laughs> so they went back and forth in the speech. I think there must have been 10 editions of it, working in the, uh, the breakfast room at the, at the mansion. Working in the breakfast room at the mansion. And then about 2.30 in the morning, Clinton finally went to sleep. Woke up at 6.30 to practice the speech because we had set up a podium and moderate staging just like it was gonna be here. Um, he came down at 6.30 and said, I'm, this is not the speech I want to give. We have to write it again. This is, we're going to do this all over again. But Frank had, at 2.30 in the morning, when Clinton went to bed and assumed that everything was over, that the speech writing was over, Frank apparently hadn't worked with Clinton all that much. <laughs> he had released, he had given an advanced text of the speech to John King, who was then a uh, national writer for AP, and the speech text had already run on the AP wire, and Frank said, your speech is already printed in most daily newspapers in the country, <laughs> so this is, we can't rewrite the speech. And for the first time in my memory, and I'm not sure how many times it might have happened since then, the, Clinton, the speech he gave that day was exactly as it was written. <laughs> and he didn't have a, have a teleprompter. And then the way things changed the technology, I think by the time Clinton gave his speech here Saturday, by the time I got back to the Capitol Hotel bar, the speech had gone viral everywhere, and everybody had a copy of it, everybody had the video. It was, my little iPhone was buzzing with messages from it. But 20, year, about 20 years ago, about three days before the announcement, Steve Silverman, who was a young attorney in New York and who I had known in, pre, in some of the previous Mondale campaigns was dispatched to Little Rock to help us with scheduling. I think he may have been the first national staff person to show up at the headquarters. And of course he was the only one. So very quickly he was assigned, I, his duties increased to general office manager, director of volunteers, uh, getting office supplies set up, and he inherited some um, press responsibilities. 
uh, which brings up, you know, all of our friends who are not here, like Mike Galden. I would love for him to be here today and to speak about his memories, because I know he had a major crisis on his hands himself. Um, well, we, we didn't have auto-programmable faxes then. We just had faxes that you, you know, punched in the number and fed them, punched in the phone number and fed them one at a time, and all of a sudden were flooded with these national press people asking for a copy of the speech. We assumed if we put it on the news wires, it would be, everybody pick it up from there. So Steve became the deputy press secretary and spent, I think, the next three days holed up in the headquarters along with one of our star volunteers at the time, my daughter Sarah, who was a junior at Central, feeding literally hundreds of copies of the text into the facts and sending it off. I just can't imagine doing that today. It's, it's, it seems so archaic. Um, in addition to Sarah, our assistants on the grounds here setting up things included such experienced political and advanced work people as my other daughter, Katie Lindsay, <laughs> Molly Buford and Mary Ellen Buford, who would convince them to stay out of school that day, Erin Trimble, Leabeth Campbell, Leabeth Campbell, and they were helping me set up on the lawn. They both told me this week, they all told me this weekend they remember us putting chairs in one places for some of the older and dignitary people to come, and they had to put them all out, and then we decided not to put them, not to put chairs on the ground, and then we decided to put them on the other side of the stage. Um, and then we decided we wanted children on the stage, and then we decided we didn't. So they, they, these, you know, I guess 10th, 11th graders got a, a real lesson in crisis management at the time. Molly is the only one of that group who went on to do anything after that. Um, the other thing I remember, not about this specific event, but about um, things that happened that day, Jer while all of this was going on, and I was pinch hinting as well I could on this event, there was another whole advance team that, who actually coordinated the event. I was, I was involved in setting up Bill and Hillary's first trip to New Hampshire as an official candidate, which was, they left three days after the third to go do. Um, we had Patty Kreiner had been dispatched to New Hampshire. Is Patty here? Patty Kreiner had been dispatched to New Hampshire two or three weeks before to try to find, find us some friends there and to set up a political organization. And she was, I think, still there by herself almost at this point. She may have had some um, college volunteer folks around. But we obviously needed more help for this three-day trip. So I called my friends Mitchell Swartz and Wendy Smith, who were, again, old advance buddies from the Mondale campaign. They lived in New York, and they were consultants, so they had a little bit of free time. And I said, okay, guys, I have this friend who's about to announce for president. And you may not know much about him. You may not love him as much as I do right now, but I need some help. And I need for you to go to New Hampshire for a week and set all of this up. Do all the hotel, there's no one on the ground to help you. You need to do all the hotels, all the cars, all the drivers, establish the, the routes that you get from one place to another and work out all of those logistics. And I said, you know, and I can't promise to pay you anything right now except expenses, but I'll keep working on that. And I know that, that even if you don't end up loving him as much as we do, as much as we do it'll be a good experience and I'll consider it a personal favor. Of course, they did go to New Hampshire. They met Patty and fell in love with her as much as anybody else who's ever worked or met her, and with Bill Clinton as well. And they ended up, not on the campaign, but Wendy worked for him through the whole administration. So you just kind of hit the ground running and call in chits from everybody you know and, and get it done as fast as you can. Um, I know there are a whole host of others who were involved in all those activities, and. A lot of you are here today. I mean, someone had to build the crowd. Someone had to get those signs printed. Someone had to get those buttons printed. And others served as just helping facilitate the whole event. And I'm, I'm surprised every time I do a big event like this of how many people it takes to get everything done. There's always a seemingly overwhelming amount of chaos. Skip and I were talking this morning about chaos. That never changes. 
but it takes a host, a village, a city of dedicated people to help turn that chaos into something meaningful. So today, I, I think it seems so ancient, some of, some of these practices and some of the, you know, where we were and believe that we could launch a presidential campaign with what we had on the ground. And it turned, you know, it grew exponentially almost every day with every primary. There were 10 more press people added. There was another plane. There were all these other expectations. But in the end, we all, good people from Arkansas, struggled and pulled it together and made it happen. Um, the other, before, but then other people started, other people not from Arkansas started coming in. And I do recall that after the speech, we were, Clinton came back into this building. We were downstairs. There was Bruce, uh, Jim Lyons, who was a friend of Hillary's at the uh, Children's Defense Fund, and now attorney in um, Conway, uh, Colorado, who came in. Kevin O'Keefe, same friend of Hillary's, who was in Chicago and had been a little bit involved in politics there. And Frank White and Stan Greenberg, who was the pollster, and Al Fromm, who was the uh, director of the DLC at that point. Um, Clinton turned around to them and said, okay, guys, you all need to go to Bruce Lindsay's law firm and figure out what we do tomorrow. I just announced for president and we don't have a thing worked out here and you're scaring me to death. <laughs> and that's what happened at that meeting is when they first laid out on the table and talked about Dave Wilhelm, George Stephanopoulos, uh, Paul Begala, and, and Carvel, and Eli Siegel, who was the other friend who was there, um, was appointed the task of interviewing all those people, making a decision, and getting, getting them down here as fast as possible. Good. <laughs> Eli Siegel's another one we miss. Uh, Phyllis uh, was here this weekend. So, it's, okay, Mac. Yeah, I remember, and you can recollect uh, or tell me I was wrong, which is not won't be the first time you've done that. Um, but I remember in, in 1991 us sitting around talking, and you telling me that Bill Clinton really was going to run for president, and I kept asking you, does he have a chance to win? And you kept telling me, don't ever underestimate the guy. Uh, you got very involved in his campaign, so would you talk about the early days and then uh, as it progressed to White House? Well, Dean Rutherford, I will be pleased to do that. Uh, first of all, I, I really would be remiss if I just did not convey in a very heartfelt way, it's wonderful to be home and see so many dear and long-standing friends here and be in this marvelous facility so on a perfect Arkansas uh, day. So first of all, let me begin with that. Secondly, Skip, as I remember it, uh, leading up to this, this day as you so properly punctuated in your comments and Bev uh, framed so, so thoughtfully and, and eloquently in her, her comments, this had been a continuum, if you will, uh, not only f for me, but for many others, uh, many of whom are here. And it really started, I won't go back to the first race, uh, uh, Margaret, in 19, uh, whatever year it was, against John Paul Hammersmith, but, um, but it, it really started in, in July and August when then Governor Clinton called me and asked me to come to the governor's mansion to discuss this possible run for the presidency. I knew it was not a good omen when the air conditioning was out at the governor's mansion in August in Arkansas, and we were discussing this on the porch there in the shade, but still very hot. And at that time, as most of you remember, President Bush, 41, was truly at about 90% in the polls in terms of approval rating after the Gulf War. So this looks like, at best, a long shot southern governor from a small state running for president with Governor Cuomo Sr., not Andrew, his son, Mario Cuomo, looming as a large potential uh, candidate. But the governor and I had both been involved in the new Democrat movement that Bev noted out from the Democratic Leadership Council that really cast a new kind of Democrat that had a third way and emphasized opportunity, responsibility, community, and had a different approach to governing and a different approach for this country 
And that's really what Bill Clinton was anxious to discuss with the American people and why he thought he could perhaps win this campaign or at least, at least raise the right issues and, and wage a very vigorous campaign. So we talked about it. Skip uh, reconstructed there quite skillfully as Skip has the ability to do. I think generally uh, I had a, a positive and supportive feeling. I did ask the then governor some pointed questions about how he would organize his campaign, why he thought he might could run. Of course, he had been a national figure to some extent as head of the National Governors Association and made a real mark in education both here in Arkansas and nationally. Arkansas's job creation was, Jimmy Lewis, you'll recall, very solid. So he had a good record to, to run on. So what I recall, Skip, about this day was a sense of unease which you and I discussed. I had had the great privilege to be appointed to three presidential commissions by President George Bush 41, even though I'm a lifelong Democrat. These were all related to the energy area other than the St. Louis Federal Reserve Board. And by happenstance, I was scheduled to be at a small dinner on energy matters with President Bush three days before Governor Clinton's announcement for president. I was a bit uneasy. <laughs> but you don't turn down the sitting president with an invitation, and you certainly don't turn down your governor of your home state and a lifelong friend to be at his announcement. So I thought it was proper to do both. Um, what I do recall about that speech, and Bev noted, the governor called me, kind of gave me his best thoughts about the speech. He said, what's your advice? I said, not too long. He said, I got it. <laughs> uh, he, exactly. Um, it was a, a great kickoff. I think he framed the, the campaign well. And what I remember the next day is Lisa Myers, pretty tough investigative reporter from NBC, called me. My name had been given to the national press. And she started bearing down about wanting to, me to criticize President Bush, and I just would not do it. I kept saying, Governor Clinton will run a vigorous campaign. He'll develop the issues. He's had a great record in Arkansas. He'll run as a new Democrat. I had my talking points down, but not in my talking points was to criticize the sitting president. The next day, I get a call from Bill Clinton. Mac, great interview. Perfect, made all our points but we didn't give your name to the national press to endorse George Bush. <laughs> and I said, oh, now, you know, give, give, me, give me a break here. Uh, the rest of it, I think, rolled out from that speech that Bev has outlined, and Jimmy Liu, of course, was part of it uh, and part of history that day. I think what's interesting, particularly as we see the presidential campaigns now in the Republican primaries, is as skilled and talented as Bill Clinton was, and certainly is, he grew during that campaign. His first national interview was okay to good, but not skilled and flawless, and he got progressively better. And I knew he was kind of uh, beginning to develop some momentum when he was going to be on the Today Show. And this is a true story. I was in New York for an analyst meeting uh, for ARCLA at the time. I was walking down Park Avenue there at 7 o'clock in the morning, kind of getting my thoughts collected before a meeting later in the day. Here comes a motorcade, only one police car, and one follow car. All of a sudden, they slam on their brakes at 7 o'clock in the morning in New York. Governor Clinton gets out of the car, comes over, shakes hands with me, who's walking down the street. I said, this is a good omen. I think you're going to win this race. <laughs> but I think once he and, and of course, uh, Missy and Mark are here, Libby and Mark are here, uh, once he rolled out of that convention with Al Gore on that bus tour, uh, it, it was momentum from that point forward. And you could just see it building with people beginning to think, as he proved himself in the debates, that this person has the right stuff to be, to be president. And that's what it, it proved to be. So it was a historic moment. And I think it set the, the tone of the campaign, Skip, uh, here in this convention. Then, of course, the president-elect came back and made most of his cabinet appointments here in this, in this very facility as well.
If you're going to run for president, you ought to have Jimmy Lou Fisher introduce you because you have a really good shot at getting elected. <laughs> Jimmy Lou, you played a big role that day. You played a big role Saturday. Will you talk a little bit about it? Thanks, Skip. I literally cringe every time Skip Rutherford calls me <laughs> because, because I never know what he's volunteered me for, but I love him and, and known him since his years in Batesville. But I literally came to this event the 11th hour. Skip called me about 10 or 11 o'clock the night before October 3rd, just a few hours before uh, the cameras were to roll and he was to announce for president. He called me and said, Jimmy Lou, Senator David Pryor was to introduce Bill Clinton, but he's stuck in Washington. Will you do it? Well, of course, he knows he wa I wasn't going to say no. I said, I will do it if you'll help, if you'll write the remarks. Well, he did, and uh, some of the drafts were quite funny about my hair. My <laughs> True story, we were going to talk about my beehive. <laughs> it was a great day, and I, of course I didn't sleep that night, and I think I shared with Sheila Brofman some of the uh, pro thoughts I had that morning. And she went on to, as you know, uh, do the Arkansas Travelers, which was a great uh, part of that campaign, but I digress. When uh, Harry Thomason was to introduce me, and I know he was surprised when he got here and found out he wasn't introducing a senator here. A senator, he was introducing uh, a, sta a state treasurer. And it seems that every time I introduce Bill Clinton, the weather's hot, either that or just hot where we are. And, um, but it was a beautiful day. And I remember coming up the side of the old state house and how wonderful it was to be here. Because if I remember correctly, didn't he uh, announce for attorney general in front of this building? Or somewhere in and around, I'm not, I'm not sure, but he's always had, it. yeah. Gubernatorial, I'm sorry. Yeah, there were a lot of campaigns, Jimmy Lou. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, I've been circling on most of them, but I began my speech that day by saying, this is history. And it was for me and for the people of Arkansas and for each and every one of you in this room and the, what, two and a half million people that we have in the state of Arkansas, we all rallied to help Bill Clinton because we were so proud of him. Uh, the rest of my speech goes like this. If you'll just imagine me with a lot of hair <laughs> and a nervous voice talking about Bill Clinton. This is history. I can remember back in 1976, I was the Greene County Treasurer from Paragool, Arkansas. Remember back? Still wearing my hair in a beehive. We just had to keep that in the speech. That was. <laughs> <laughs> I had the honor of introducing a young man that was going to be the Attorney General of the state of Arkansas. Now, this was 20 years ago. I say that was 15 years ago. Well, now, 35 years later, uh, we know, all know what happened. Today, I'm the treasurer of the great state of Arkansas. I've changed my hair, and today I have the honor of introducing the same man who is going to be our next president of the United States. And then I go to, on to talk about his leadership, and as, as the day went on, uh, as it came closer and closer time for me to speak, I had to keep cutting things out of my speech because time was running out, and everything had to be timed just to the minute. Now, I'm not used to Bill Clinton having to be on exact time. So I'm not sure, you know, are they just cutting me because of who I am or is it really a time? But it was, it was. But I did uh, end my speech by talking about looking back and that in introduction of 1976. I think all, think of all of, the, of what we in Arkansas have done together in those 15 years. The next 20, we all still continued 
to work together. Word of our progress, our success, has spread throughout this country. Wherever I go, people want to share in that progress. Didn't that happen to you when, when he ran, was running for president? How many of you wore the, 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 the badge that said, ask me about my governor? Great. I think that was one of the greatest uh, things that, one of the greatest things you did in the campaign. And they want the people of this state to share this man with them. We share, we all have a piece of Bill Clinton. I know everybody says I'm a friend of Bill Clinton, but we are all a friend of Bill Clinton. If you didn't, if you doubted that, did you see him speak to everyone he possibly could Saturday? And Mac, he still remembers the names. Oh, yeah. I mean, he, yeah, uh, so much better than I. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the high honor and great privilege of introducing Chelsea Clinton, who was just this high, Hillary Clinton, and our governor, the next president of the United States, Bill Clinton. That was a great day in my life, and I had no idea what a roller coaster we were all going to be in, but that literally planted the seed for what would grow for the progress of this country, and we were all so proud, and we can take pride today of his accomplishments. She uh, forgave me for putting the beehive in there. I just thought it was too good. One of the things about that day was don't stop thinking about tomorrow. And some of you know the story, but here it is. The uh, Governor Clinton was on a trip uh, in a western state and riding in the car some young person said, you know, Governor, if you ever run for president, you ought to use this song as your theme song. And he popped it in, uh, I guess at the time, what, who was it, 1991, what kind of contraption, I'm, we, what kind of, whether, whether it was, a, whatever we were using at the time. And, it, and, and, and the governor liked it by, by Fleetwood Mac, who were still performing at that time. So fast forward. October 2nd, 1991, in the old paint store. Bev over here, working hard. I'm trying to rap, to write a speech because David Pryor couldn't come and trying to get Jimmy Lou and to, and to get it done. We were sitting over there all thinking about what was gonna happen, who was gonna do all this. And Bev, I think it was you that called, that said, okay, what, what kind of music are you gonna play uh, after his speech, what are we gonna, come out with, we got to get it, we got to get the, the, the CD or whatever we got over here. And so everybody looked at each other and said, what kind of music are we going to play? And somebody said, I don't have a clue. And finally, Bruce Lindsay said, you know, he liked that song by Fleetwood Mac, something called about Don't Stop Thinking About Tomorrow. Some young person on a trip suggested we... He likes that song, That's, we, I guess we ought to go with it. Nobody could remember the song. <laughs> now in 1991, remember, Walmart didn't stay open 24-7. <laughs> Nobody had, but we sent somebody to Walmart. And this was, I think, about 637. Again, trying to figure out who was gonna introduce, none of this was put together. They had a CD of Fleetwood Mac's greatest hits. David Watkins was the only person that had a car there that, that had a CD player. <laughs> so we all crammed in David Watkins' car. <laughs> Looked really weird. People, like the scene of a phone booth, you know, you had everybody crammed in this car. With the thing turned up saying, oh yeah, that'll work. So we got the CD over to Bev. Bill Clinton announces, Speech goes well, don't stop thinking about tomorrow, blares out. Everybody at the event seemed to like it. The national media panned it the next day. They said, here is a governor that's gone back to an old song that's not, you know, this, this band doesn't even exist anymore. 
Bob Kerry was running for president. He used John Mellencamp's song, Small Town, uh, as his theme song. David Wilhelm arrives as campaign manager a few days later. In a letter on his desk from the attorneys of Fleetwood Mac, <laughs> saying cease and desist from using this song. True. Wilhelm never responded to the letter. <laughs> Within two weeks, the song had cracked the top 10. Fleetwood Mac reunited. <laughs> and Don't Stop Thinking About Tomorrow has been played for the last 20 years over and over again. So it's interesting how a presidential announcement and a song that literally came from a Walmart store to a car to Bev to throwing it out there to cease and desist uh, has, has, has made it. Um, one of the stories that I'd like to ask from the audience, and I'd like Sheila Bronfman to tell it, and we need to, Sheila, where are you sitting? Where are you? Okay, get the microphone. Because I, I remember part of it, but not to the extent that Sheila remembers. This is the story of how the Arkansas Travelers happened. Sheila. Well, uh, we were in the uh, paint store back in that back bay where we were storing stuff, and we'd been getting hundreds of calls from many of you in this room who wanted to do something and wanted to help. And it wasn't just the young people, it was the doctors and the lawyers and the teachers and the retired folks who couldn't take off and actually come work in the campaign. So Robin Armstrong and Skip and I stood in the back and started talking about what could we do and how could we involve these people because we didn't want to leave them out. And Robin actually never ended up becoming a traveler. She had some life incidences come along, she couldn't do it. I called uh, Dorothy Pageant, who was the director of the Peanut Brigade for Jimmy Carter, and asked her what she had done and what she would do differently and how we could get our group going. She told me they had traveled mostly by bus and they had sort of come in and come out and she said two things I'd do differently. I'd go in smaller groups, I'd go in vans, and I would be an absolute dictator. Well, that worked really well for me. <laughs> so, so, so that's what happened. <laughs> we went and we started telling everybody, come on. We had sent with Patty Kreiner, Dale Evans had gone to New Hampshire already and was up, up there. And then we sent a group to Florida immediately coming in December for the Florida straw poll. And then over 100 folks hit New Hampshire in early January, some going twice. I stayed there about six weeks. And it sort of became history after that because then we were on the road. We did 26 states. We had over 400 people who traveled, all paying their own way, all paying their own expenses. And probably Kenneth Starr would have gotten us all for something if uh, he had ever gotten our names, but he, he wasn't able to. <laughs> we didn't publish anything. So. Thanks, Sheila. I mean, the Arkansas Travelers. I, th I, think from the, I think from the history point of that, the interesting point was that Sheila started working on this in September before the October announcement, and the Travelers were ready to hit the ground running. Beth. Looking out in the audience and, and feeling the room remind, remembered one more thing I wanted to add, and it's back to my a comparison of how things stay the same and sometimes that's not a good thing. I, I do remember working with the advance team to set up on the lawn out front and they just couldn't figure out what to do with that damn fountain <laughs> that was in the way. And they, you know, finally called me and said, you know these people at the Department of Arkansas Heritage because I'd been at the Arkansas Arts Council and had just left. You know these people, just call them over there and tell them they need to take down that fountain <laughs> for the speech so we can build a press riser around it. And I said, I am not touching that. <laughs> that is sacred. You, we're, we're, we're not touching it and I'm, I'm not going to be any part of that. And they, uh, is, is Bill here, Bill Gatewood? Do, do you remember, Bill, the, the conversation back and forth? Yeah. Okay, well, 
The fountain did Nobody not wants to remember it. The, this was a state institution, not, remember. The fountain did not come down. The press riser got built right at the edge of the fountain so, and really high. So everybody was shooting over it. And that's why if you look at, at the shots of that day, they're really tight and they're kind of down like that. Well, lo and behold, I was not involved in any of the preparation for the events this past weekend, but someone did call me and say, you won't believe they've asked the state house, the old state house to take down the fountain so they can build the thing. <laughs> and again, I said, good luck with that one. That ain't gonna happen. And if it does, I'm gonna be really mad. And you notice they didn't take it down. I don't thank, think any thank you of, all for your leadership in preserving the fountain. <laughs> that's what I want to say. I, I don't think anyone realizes the work and the effort uh, that the old state house for 20 years has put into this. There have been lots of Clinton events here, uh, and you know we look at it as a picture of a beautiful building as a backdrop. But for the staff and the people of the 20 years work at the old state house, they've put an enormous an incredible amount of time into making these. I'm going to tell one other old state house story. Uh, I told Mac I was going to do this. I really have not talked about this one um, personally a lot. And it happened uh, when he was named White House Chief of Staff. And it happened in this building. Um, the night before he was named Chief of Staff, or the announcement was made, uh, he went to see his mother, who was, who was ill at the time. And he said that he wanted to let her know that tomorrow he was going to be named Chief of Staff. And that he knew that she was ill and didn't feel like coming, but that it would probably be on the television and for her to watch. And then after the ceremony and the announcement, he would come back uh, to her home and would would, would give her the full account and the full story. And uh, so we, we, and this had been, this was pretty good. This story had not leaked yet. This story, nobody knew this. And, and so it was, we were working very hard to keep it that way. We were sequestered in the old state house and President Clinton and Mac and others were there. And I happened to walk into the bathroom, and at which point uh, I heard this story. That morning, this was about 15 minutes before the announcement was to be made, and there was a knock at the front door of the old state house, and Wolf Blitzer opens the door, and Helen McClarty is there, Mac's mother. And Helen McClarty says, and Wolf Blitzer says, may I help you? And Helen McClarty said, well, yes, my name is Helen McClarty, and I'm here because my son Mac is getting ready to be named White House Chief of Staff. <laughs> Nobody knew this. Wolf Blitzer had a scoop, <laughs> and Helen McClarty had a great seat. <laughs> Wolf Blitzer comes and stands at the edge of the bathroom, and I'm in the bathroom. <laughs> and Wolf Blitzer is on the phone saying, run with it, go with it. Yes, put it on the screen. Bill Clinton's boyhood, lifelong friend, Mac McClarty, being named today White House Chief of Staff. Put it on, run it on CNN, break in. We've, nobody else has it. Well, I got it from his mother. <laughs> Wolf Blitzer, so proud of his scoop. I go back to the holding room where the White House Chief of Staff to be and the President-elect are in a conversation. And I say, guys, I gotta have a 30 seconds of your time. <laughs> Mac, they know you're being named White House Chief of Staff. And he said, who leaked it? 
I said, your mother. <laughs> With Bill Clinton looking down, he says, Clinton says, you're, Helen leaked it? <laughs> and Max said, what is, my mother's not here. I said, oh yes sir, she is. <laughs> and, and that's the other thing you need to know about this. She's got a front, I mean, the second row, Wolf Blitzer took care of your mother. <laughs> so when you go out there, don't get emotional because your mother's ill and she, she, he said, well, well, what happened? I said, Mac, she just wanted to see her son be named White House Chief of Staff and she got out of her sick bed to come down here and do it. And Clinton said, that's the best story I've ever heard. That's wonderful. <laughs> So, are you finished? <laughs> yes. But it's great, and it was another part of the history at the old State House that I thought, again, I've not told that story before. I got clearance to tell it, so I just want, but it was one of the great, great stories. Uh, now, let's, let me ask anybody in the audience who was here on that day and has a memory about it. Bev and Jimmy Lou. We were talking about the crowds. It was also hotter on October 3rd, as I recall that time, than it was this year. Uh, does anybody else have any memories they'd like to share about that particular day or something that happened here at the, at the old State House? Come on, don't be shy. Sheila just told us about the travelers. Does anybody else recall? Who was here that day? Who was here on October 3rd? All right. Half the crowd. Somebody, you got a memory here. What do you remember? Somebody tell me what you remember. Okay, way to go. Wait. Yeah. I remember standing by the old Roger Stevens building and John Robert Starr was standing back in the back of the building timing Bill Clinton the entire speech. <laughs> well, Mac had told him to keep it short. So, Anybody else? The other hands were up. Come on. We had other hands. What else do you remember? That Margaret, let's get one right up here. I remember it very well, and I was with my late husband, Carl, of course, and when all the excitement was over with and we were leaving the grounds of the old state house, someone came up to my husband and said, Carl, do you think Bill Clinton can really be president? And Carl's reply was, if he can talk to every voter in America, he will be. <laughs> and I think he did. Yes, we have Blotty, Bob Lottie has a comment. I remember that day as well, but I also remember the night before, and I got a call, Jimmy Lou, from Bev, asking me to participate on the program that uh, next day, and she says, I'm not certain what you will be asked to do yet, but I want you to, uh, to help us out, and, uh, and she told me why. And I think I may have introduced Harry or something, but we, uh, we did that, and uh, talking about the back and forth back there in the back as to, you know, where you stand so you wouldn't be in the shot and, and this kind of thing. And uh, it's, it's, it's all of those kinds of things that go on in the background in the sense of the timing as Jimmy Lou talked about and, and, and Harry trying to uh, keep us sane by keeping us laughing, I guess, and this kind of thing. So it was all those things, but I think for me, as with so many other folk, uh, it truly was a turning point. And I had a dilemma because I was vice chair of the DNC at the time, and we were supposed to remain neutral. So I was trying to get in touch with Ron Brown, who was chair, to say, you know, I'm going to do this, but I'm still honoring my neutrality, but this is a native son, and I think there is a way for us to have an exception to the rule. So it, was, it truly was a wonderful day. It was. Anne, Anne McCoy, good. I'm Anne McCoy, and I was the administrator of the Arkansas Governor's Mansion at that time. Number one, I wanted to say that one day, um, Governor Clinton came in the kitchen, and Buddy Young, one of his favorite uh, secret well, uh, state police yeah. 
and I were in there, and uh, he said, now, you all, I'm getting ready to make an announcement. This is strictly, you know, in the Q QT, and I, I really think I am going to run for president of the United States. And Buddy and I looked at each other, although we, we had an inkling of all this, and we almost said in unison, if you can shake hands and look people in the eye across this country, there's no question but what you'll win. And one other thing I want to say is I rode over in the motorcade with them 20 years ago today, and of course all the festivities have been talked about, but I have to say that from that day on, the Arkansas Governor's Mansion was never the same. <laughs> it was fabulous. 